The title of this talk is Life Between Buildings. That's actually the title of a book by Jan Gale, who is a Danish architect and professor of urban design in Copenhagen. He wrote it in the early uh, 1970s. And uh, his concern in that book is with the design and the use of the public space between buildings. He distinguishes three kinds of activities uh, between buildings, what he calls essential activities, optional activities, and social activities. And his main concern in his book is uh, social activities and the design of public spaces to maximize social activities. Here in Mumbai, I find that everyone is talking about uh, providing accommodation for resettlement of 250 square feet or 300 square feet or 400 square feet. And no one seems to care about what happens, what your experience is when you step outside your building. This talk is about one narrow aspect of public space. The focus is on FSI and how this affects life out of doors. Now, I think we have to remind ourselves that Indian cities have evolved over centuries through the Middle Ages with narrow streets and shallow buildings. In general, they do not have the grand layouts and the leafy avenues of their Western counterparts. New Delhi is an exception, but then uh, its layout was a Western imposition and the, uh, has nothing to do with the way Old Delhi was laid out and developed, or indeed any other Indian city, barring a few more recent exceptions. We must also remember that Indian cities are more like European cities, compact layouts, unlike their American uh, counterparts. Now in every city, buildings are meant to conform to a set of building codes, informal uh, to begin with and later formalized. These codes are quite complex. Buildings are required to conform perhaps to a set front line as on Marine Drive. There is a minimum required side space and rear space. And the plinths are often mandated to cover no more than a specified fraction of the total plot area. The maximum number of floors is also often specified. A post-World War II innovation from America introduced a new form of building control. This is called FSI, Floor Space Index, in Mumbai and FAR, floor area ratio, everywhere else in the world. It's the ratio of built up area on all floors of a building to the area of the plot on which the building is placed. The FSI regulation is generally welcomed by architects. They like the freedom to uh, reduce the plinth area and increase the height of a building and uh, that still observes the FSI rule, which uh, sets, prescribes, stipulates the maximum floor area that the building can have. But from the authority's point of view, the FSI specified has to be carefully managed to make sure that the extent of the built up floor space is um, such that the infrastructure in the locality is not overstrained, not just in regard to water supply and uh, sewerage, but more importantly in regard to transport and crowding on the streets. Let me begin by showing you a typical slide from a presentation by the World Bank. This compares FSI in different cities across the world. Notice that Amsterdam is, Mumbai is 1.33, Amsterdam is 1.9, Venice 2.4, Paris is 3, but New York is 15. And what the World Bank keeps on telling us is that look at these numbers and you'll agree that the FSI in Mumbai is too low and should be pushed up. So the current normal limit of FSI 4 
has been arrived at on the strength of presentations like this by the World Bank. And for educational institutions and hotels, the FSI permitted is much higher than four. This is a plan of Manhattan, which shows FSIs across the city. Um, this is Central Park. And we'll be talking in detail about this area, which is uh, Community District 5, the densest residential district in Manhattan. And this, which is Community District Sorry, I beg your pardon. The earlier one was Community District 8, the residential district. And this is Community District 5, CD5, which is Midtown, the uh, central business district. Uh, but the high values of FSI are here. And the FSI uh, fades away. And in the northern parts of Manhattan, it is three or less. <coughs> Uh, this is uh, Manhattan again, uh, the blue island that you see. This is Central Park. This is CD8. And this is CD5. Now, this is a, uh, a Google map of uh, CD5. Uh, let me see. This is Broadway. And this is Fifth Avenue. But what I want you to notice is, look at these green spaces here, 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 here. This total image is about 3.37 by 2 kilometers. So nowhere in, the, uh, in CD5 are you more than a kilometer away from a green space. Let's look at a few other layouts. This is CD5 again, but to a different scale, uh, which is going to be the same scale for the other images that you see which follow. Uh, this is again Broadway here and Fifth Avenue. This is Buleshwar. That is the Tata Institute of Social Sciences here. Just look at the street pattern across these images. This is Lajpat Nagar in New Delhi. This is Maharani Bagh, an upmarket residential district in Delhi. This is Sundar Nagar, the, probably the most upmarket residential part of Delhi. Uh, this is Indira Nagar in Bangalore. This is Malleshwaram in Bangalore. The, um, the streets in this image uh, on a Google map are schematic. They're not the actual widths. So if you look at a, an Aisha map of the same locality, you get a more realistic picture. The streets are quite narrow in relation to the plots. Now, the point I want to make is that layouts differ dramatically across cities and within the same city. And for a full picture, we need the number of floors and the footprints. We need impressions from a walkabout. And if we are tasked with drawing up a layout, we decide, and I put that we in brackets because I think it's important to define who that we is, to what extent it should include uh, the people who are going to live in that locality. Often, you know, this work is done by planners without reference to anyone else, and that is surely not correct. But we have to decide what kind of locality we want, the dimensions, including the dimensions for arterial transport, and the building regulations. I want to <coughs> suggest a new metric called crowding. I find, I first came across this term in a 2007 paper by Remy Prudhomme, <coughs> who uses it to discuss internal crowding, the crowding inside uh, living areas. But uh, actually, it's applicable to other kinds of uh, urban activities as well. And I think that's where it's most interesting. Uh, we normally talk about built-up area per capita five square meters per person in Mumbai, 55 square meters per person in uh, Manhattan, 
And he inverts that and talks about home crowding measured in terms of residents per he hectare of residential space. So um, if you extend this to other areas, uh, let me first explain, sorry, uh, home crowding. Here is an apartment of 1,000 square feet. This is typical of New York. Uh, you enter here. This is the kitchen. That's the living area. There's a bath. It's called a half bath because it's shared between the, your visitors and this bedroom. This is another bedroom, and that's another bath. It's a closet space and a balcony. This is a typical 1,000 square foot apartment, and it's occupied by two people. 1.7 is actually the average in Manhattan. As against that, typically in Mumbai, you'll have, sorry, this is two persons in a 100 square meter apartment. That is 200 persons per 10,000 square meters. And we'll call that a home crowding of 200 persons per hectare. As against that, this is a 250 square foot space. You enter here. This is the living area. Here's the kitchen. Here's a bath. And here's a WC. Family of five live in a 25 square meter apartment. And multiplied by 400, sorry, the image has got messed up is 2,000 uh, people in 10,000 square meters, or home crowding of 2,000 persons per hectare. My apologies, these images have got screwed up. Um, this is street crowding. This is Buleshwar. And this is Manhattan. Now, I think uh, uh, the thing to, to remember is that when you're computing street area for purposes of uh, looking at street crowding, you should exclude the area uh, for arterial traffic, whether it's two lanes or four lanes. Whatever goes into arterial traffic should not be counted as street area. And if you're going to use uh, allow street parking, that parking area should not be counted as street area. This is Dadar, I think, the flower market. Another typical street from Mumbai. Another street scene. And this is an example of street crowding as we have it today. Now, if we try and understand the controlling parameters, there are actually four. The first is indoor crowding, persons per unit of built-up area. Next is street crowding, the count of persons per unit of street area. Too loud? The third is plot factor. Uh, plot factor is buildable plot area upon the street area. And FSI is built-up area upon buildable plot area. Okay. Now, these are related in this very interesting way. Street crowding is equal to internal crowding into plot factor into FSI. I'll come back to that formula and explain it carefully later, but just look at this. If you have a home plot of one hectare and a street plot of one hectare, and this little image that you see here represents 100 persons. If you have FSI 1 and home crowding of 200 persons per hectare, then the street crowding will also be 200 persons per hectare. And Manhattan CD 8 has home crowding of 180 persons per hectare. So this is, you know, more or less representative of Manhattan. The same thing again. But now we have FSI 1, and we have home crowding of 2,000 persons per hectare. Earlier was 200. You will get street crowding also of 2,000 persons per hectare. And Mumbai's G North has home crowding of 2,181 persons per hectare. So this is an image which represents Mumbai. The earlier one was an image that represents Manhattan. Now let's look at FSI. 
FSI is 8, home crowding is 200 persons per hectare. Street crowding will be 8 times that, that's 1600 persons per hectare. So street crowding is home crowding into FSI. Okay. Now if you have two home plots for one street plot, two hectares of home area to one hectare of street area, if plot factor is 2, FSI is 1, home crowding is 200 persons per hectare, street crowding will be 400 persons per hectare. And street crowding then is home crowding into plot factor. If you combine these, plot factor is 2, FSI is 8, home crowding is 200 persons per hectare, Street crowding is 3,200 persons per hectare. And the final formula is street crowding is home crowding into plot factor into FSI. Okay. I hope I'm not going too fast. All right. So this is the formula. Street crowding is persons per hectare of street area. Internal crowding is persons per hectare of built-up area. Plot factor is plot area buildable plot area upon the street area and FSI is built up area upon the plot area. As you can see on the right hand side these terms built up area and built up area cancel out, plot area and plot area cancel out and you're left with persons upon street area which is the left hand side. Now until now we've been using terms like net density but this is not um, something that's easily grasped. I actually find street crowding and indoor crowding much easier, much easier to grasp than net density, which is internal crowding times FSI. And gross density is actually persons upon the street area plus the plot area. We do need gross density for global planning. But otherwise, I think these two terms, net density and gross density, which have been widely used by planners in the past, are not as meaningful as uh, street crowding and indoor crowding. Now, there are other kinds of crowding that we could look at. Home crowding would be persons per unit of home area. Job crowding would be number of jobs, number of persons uh, per uh, office area. Amenity crowding is the number of persons per amenity area, amenities being hospitals and schools. Park crowding would be persons upon the park area. Street crowding is, of course, persons upon the street area. Then you could have plot factor uh, subscript H as the plot factor for homes upon the street area. And sorry, that's got mixed up again. Plot factor J which is the office's plot area upon the street area. And the, fo the fo formula would then be street crowding is home crowding into the plot factor for homes into FSI. That's the nighttime number. And job crowding into plot factor for jobs into FSI. That's the daytime number. Now, I'm not saying that uh, everyone who lives in that area or who works in that area will be out on the streets at the same time. What I am saying is that whatever fraction of people are out on the streets, whether it's 20% or 15% or 10%, um, will be uh, doubled if you uh, double the street crowding and halved if you halve the street crowding. And the maximum, the peak crowding probably would be in the evening when people from who are living there and people who are working there are both out on the streets. Now let's take a look at Mumbai's wards. Uh, this is a map of all the wards. And this is the map of the uh, island city wards, where uh, I'd like you to notice that uh, C ward is Bhuleshwar, but is also part of Marine Drive. B ward has a lot of the port area. E ward has the port area. D ward east is Grant Road. D ward west is Malabar Hill. G North includes uh, Dharavi. And uh, here is a table that compares numbers between Manhattan and uh, the island city. And you see that the all users indoor crowding, that is jobs and homes, 
is 296 in CD5, 180 in CD8, and in our wards it's 600, 600, 1,200, 366 in D West, that is Malabar Hill, 3,116 in G North. So our indoor crowding is way above Manhattan's already. FSI here in Manhattan is 16, CD5, 7.29 in CD8. And here it's 3.66 to 1.79, 2.05, 1, 1, 1, little over 1 here. The plot factor is much lower in Manhattan, 1.26, 1.57. Here in A ward we have 0.73, in B ward we have 0.88. This is because of the defense area and the port trust. Otherwise it's 2.39, 2.45. In D west it's 4.71. And uh, that is because of the area occupied by, I think, the um, uh, Parsi Towers of Silence and the Governor's Residence. So these are huge plots uh, which uh, push up this number, the plot factor. Otherwise, it's 2.84, 2.2. And the street crowding here in CD5 is 5986, 2190 in CD8. And here it's 1,000, 1,000, 4,992, 5,000, 182. These values are much higher than CD8. And don't forget, Manhattan has an underground railway, which takes the pressure off the streets. Now I want to show you a graph which uh, describes these localities uh, graphically. We plot indoor crowding on the right-hand side, 1,000, 2,000, 3,000 persons per hectare. Outdoor crowding on the minus x-axis, 2,000, 4,000, 6,000. And we first have these lines of plot factor, which are really multiplier lines, because if you take indoor crowding of 2,000, multiplied by plot factor of 1, you'll get a product of 2,000. If you take 2,000, plot factor of 2, you'll get 4,000. And these are similar multiplier lines for the FSI lines, 0 0.5, 1, 2, 4, 8, and 16 FSI. Now, if you look at CD8, you see that it has indoor crowding, which is around 200, and outdoor crowding, which is a little over 2,000. This is the diagram for CD8. This is the diagram for C ward, where the indoor crowding is 800 and something, the street crowding is 5,000. This is Charkop. This is an area I like very much, which I think uh, is uh, a model of what an urban layout should be, which is mixed, uh, mixed income. And um, the important thing about these localities in comparing them is that they have to be of a certain size. They need to be about two or three square kilometers so that they are large enough to accommodate all the amenities and all the open spaces that you would expect to find within walking distance in a locality. Charkop in that sense is too small, it's only 80 hectares, but I think it could be extended uh, and uh, could be representative of a larger locality. This is D West, fairly low indoor crowding, fairly low street crowding. This is the Malabar Hill area. This is D East, which is Grant Road. This is CD5, very high outdoor crowding, but very low indoor crowding. And this is G North, Dharavi, very high indoor crowding, but quite modest street crowding. And these are the densities that you get, if you convert these to densities, you get densities of around 500, this is 500, this is 1000. So, you know, around 700, 800 are most of the densities residential. Blue is residential, red is jobs. And this takes you to about 1500. Now, if you look at images of cities, this is Singapore, that's Sao Paulo, that's New York, this is Mumbai. Mumbai again, Mumbai, 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 and Mumbai.
How have we come to this? Where more than half the city's population lives in slums. I think there are three components, three different sets of policies that underlie the problem. And unless we make a change in all three, nothing much is going to change. Or rather, unless we change all three underlying policies, whatever we do will only make things worse. The first of these three, I think, is the Rent Act. No other city in the world has our kind of Rent Act, which keeps two million people in homes for which they pay more or less World War II rentals. The, force, the first and most direct consequence of the Rent Act was that all construction for rental stopped dead in its tracks as soon as the Rent Act was introduced. When I was a child, the thumb rule was that for a moneyed family that you put one third of your money into gold, one third into stocks, and one third into property. And the property was normally uh, for rental. Property prices were expected to go on rising, keeping pace with inflation or better. And rental income from, uh, from property would also similarly keep on rising. Once the Rent Act was in place, investment for rental stopped altogether. So today, the only place where someone from a middle or low income family can get rented accommodation is inside a slum. It is self-policing. The writ of government doesn't run there. Formal laws don't apply. Now, we've come to believe in recent uh, months that leave and license uh, works fairly well and there's no need to modify the Rent Act. And there's no need to, to raise the hornet's nest that messing with the Rent Act would provoke. I don't think that's true. Leave and license arrangements work well with the literate and well-off, but no one has forgotten the 1980s when leave and license arrangements were working quite well. We did have leave and license even then. And government suddenly declared that all leave and license properties came under the Rent Act. The same fear persists today. If leave and license arrangements are extended to poor and middle income families, the genuine fear is that government will once again be tempted by the number of votes it can gain and will once again bring the, bring the Rent Act into force on all these properties. So unless the Rent Act is firmly abandoned once and for all, there's going to be no formal investment in middle or low income housing for rental. I don't think the problem of how to amend the Rent Act is intractable. I think there are a number of ways in which this can be done. Uh, this is not the time or place to go into those details, but I think uh, suffice it to say that I think it not only can be done, but must be done if we want to get out of our present dismal plight. The second fundamental change that we need is in regard to mandating housing for the poor. When the British were here, if you wanted to build a bungalow, you were expected to build servants' quarters in the same compound to house your bearer, your cook, your driver, your dhobi. When the textile mills were built, the workers were provided with chawls to live in. The living conditions were dreadful, not only by today's standards, but even by the standards of that time. But there, there was no question that if you created a job, you simultaneously concerned yourself with how and where your employees would live. With independence, all that has changed. Now you can hire as many people as you like, and you do not have to bother about their, where they live. So in 2005, an RTI inquiry revealed that we had 4,413 police constables and 81 police inspectors living in slums. I've seen a jopri with an air conditioner in it, and I was told that it's a police inspector. <laughs> These are officers of the law who are illegal residents of the city. The government will give the policeman a job, but not a place to pitch his tent. 
the numbers of police uh, constables and inspectors who live in slums has probably slightly increased since 2005, but responses to RTI inquiries are now more cagey and much more crafty than they used to be. There's a way out of this, and it's called inclusionary housing. Policies addressing the problem of housing the poor exist in many countries of how to house those who have, who, whose income is below the median. England, France, Italy, Spain, Canada, the US, other countries all have such policies. They simply mandate that whenever you build floor space for any purpose, whether it's an office or a mall or a cinema or a high value residential block, you are bound to set aside some predefined proportion of the total built up area for inclusionary housing. In most countries it's 25%, in Spain it is 50%. Most often the requirement is that the inclusionary housing must be on the same plot as the major development. The cost of construction is reimbursed to the developer. He's not out of pocket and has no reason to skimp on specifications. But the land for the inclusionary housing is provided by him without charge as a condition for the permission he gets to develop the rest of the property. It goes without saying that no developer in the world likes his country's policy of inclusionary housing. It's important to understand how schemes of inclusionary housing are administered. It's not left to the developer to manage everything. There are three distinct aspects of such schemes and each is placed in the hands of the agency most competent to deliver it. The developer constructs the housing. He's the, the man who knows about construction. A separate agency administered it, uh, administers it, manages and maintains the property, collects rentals. In the UK, it is typically an NGO or a housing association. Uh, it also owns the property, so it can mortgage it and uh, finance uh, maintenance if it needs to. And the third aspect is that of subsidy, which is provided by government on a family by family basis, separately administered both from the construction and from the management and maintenance. No one gets his housing free. The family may get a subsidy, but they pay rent or they buy the property from the NGO or agency administering the project, the agency is very carefully and strongly regulated by government to make sure that it doesn't charge rates which are extravagant. It's got that property without actually paying for the land. So the prices of rental and ownership in that property are lower than in the uh, neighboring uh, free market areas. But anyway, it seems to work in most countries. And finally, let me turn to the third policy uh, imperative that is distorting the city. And that's the policy of free housing. Having seen what it has done to the city in the last 10 years, I think we can all agree that it's completely unsustainable, completely unworkable on a citywide scale. The trouble is that it has actually worked on some projects like the Shapurji Palanji Towers at Tardev. So it looks successful. And, uh, you know, the promise is that this will happen everywhere. But um, is it replicable on a grand scale? I think it requires that at, le uh, at each location, you have to fulfill two essential conditions. One is that there are in that locality enough upmarket buyers to finance free construction for several times their number of families. And two, it is important that the original settlement is thinly populated enough to keep the crowding in the finished development within acceptable limits. For most of Mumbai, neither of these conditions holds. And such sites at which both conditions hold have been now, by now, exhausted. Here also, the government seems to have painted itself into a corner. Um, 
but a number of solutions are possible the best in each case depending on the particularities of that situation. I don't think in the heart of hearts uh, anyone really expects housing to be provided free. But people do understand their voting power and they do understand their bargaining power. So let me return in conclusion to the recommendations made by the World Bank for raising FSI. Let's look at a comparison of Manhattan and Mumbai's island city. Streets, in terms of land use, streets are 26% in Manhattan, 28% in Mumbai. Homes are 25 and the same here. Offices are 13.619, that is much more in Mumbai. Industrial area is also higher. Amenities are much lower. 9.3% of land area is for schools and hospitals. And here we have 2.9. Transport is not very different. Open space is much less. It's much higher in Manhattan, much less in Mumbai. And these, uh, I haven't got a, a, a detail of this. This is land use. If you look at densities, this is the population. 1.5 million in Manhattan, 3 million in Mumbai. 2 million jobs, 2 million jobs. Area is 57 square kilometers in Manhattan, 69 square kilometers in Mumbai, so more or less comparable. But look at the night densities, 265 here, 448 here, more or less the same here. But if you look at crowding, night crowding is 1003, 1567, day crowding 1768, 1630, amenity crowding is 2800 here and 15000 here. And open space crowding is 1870 here and 12,000 here. And don't forget, Manhattan has an underground railway. Which brings me back to the table that the World Bank keeps showing us, saying that Mumbai has FSI 1.33, New York has 15, and you must push up your FSI. Thank you.